Welcome back to Werewolf Heart of the Forest. It's our first night in Piavoviesha and it's a night in the woods. A lonely ray of the moonlight shines on the broken nameplate at the old grave. Imprisoned under the cold, shiny stone, the dead wait for something. I tremble. Something is coming. It's huge and monstrous. I'm a cub. I'm a wolf cub, like the ones my grandfather told me about. I will grow and my fangs will become sharper. I will taste blood. I feel a pull and I surrender to it. I run toward a clearing. There are piles of fresh corpses of people who died too young, skinned and mutilated. Their loved ones stand around them, grieving, unable to do anything waiting and suddenly there are just trees and tree trunks i look around my nostrils flare who did it who murdered the trees there's a stench in the air like meat rotting in acid but somehow worse i see the monstrous army their mandibles are whirling chainsaws their long metal arms are wrapped with black pipes that look like glistening intestines. Their smell is vile. They wait, unmoving. I pay my respect to the dead. I go through the dead trees, kneel next to them. Words come to me in a language that I don't remember, but that I know. Words about revenge and death and sacrifice. And then my voice tells me to look at the sky. There, between the stars, two shapes circle each other. An old, sad wolf with grey hair and a white weasel. They keep their eyes on one another as they continue their dance, suspicious but not hostile. We need to fight the enemy. The awful, rotting stench. I know that much. But how can we do that when we don't trust each other? They stop. They look at me and the clearing. Hmm. Do we have the power to give them our blessing? I spill my blood and bless them with words that I do not recognize, but that I understand. They come down to me and their voice is the voice of the Pusha. Welcome back, you've been away for too long a time. I wake up. Chapter 2 Logging Let's look first at our character sheet. We're still Maya Borodic and uh, we are more inspiring than in the beginning. We gained one analytical just yet. Uh, spiritual didn't change, I think it's five and cunning three. We gained that, I think, in the last episode. We're still healthy. That's, uh, yeah, that, that we learned in the last episode. My grandfather was a forest soldier after World War II, and I'm afraid that he did something terrible at the time. People, people protesting the logging clearly knew something about my family. I should go and talk to them. Anya is still loyal, Bartik is sympathetic, family is still complicated, and all the others are neutral. And the forest is sympathetic. That's great. I like that. The day after. The next morning was full of sunshine and birdsong. I could smell the, the heat of the afternoon building. 
those long honey-like hours in late June when the earth isn't tired of its own warmth yet. But it was crisp and pleasant now I got up. I sat on my bed for a moment, letting my feet dangle from it. I felt overwhelmed. The weight of the previous day had coiled up somewhere in my chest and I didn't really know what to think about everything I'd learned. And there was the dream. Then I remembered the dream. The clearing, the animals in the night sky, waiting for me. I took a shower, ate something without really paying attention and went out. And Anya joined us. It's a summer morning. We were halfway through the forest when Bartek caught up with us. You were right, Anya, the protest is important. And that's where we go. Now, we haven't been in the forest the last day. And uh, I think it was, or I think now it was either or. Either we could explore the forest itself, like generally, or the village. Now we do have like a certain spot where we go. I mean, maybe we would have ended up at the forest camp anyways, but uh, yeah. I guess I'll only know if I replay the game and go to the forest instead exploring instead of exploring the village first. But uh, now we go there. Protests, activists, answers, maybe. Against the machines. As I walked toward the logging site, I noticed there were more people heading that way police car, a couple of SUVs, a TV truck, young people on bicycles, a green Land Rover from the forest services. When I got to the side, it felt utterly surreal. Like I'd stepped onto a movie set. Anya looked around. So what's the plan? Huh. I think we need to find Lisa. There was someone I had to find and press for answers. Lisa's girlfriend. Lisa had said that her girlfriend could answer my questions. She was supposed to be here. I looked around. On my right was the ancient forest. On my left was the freshly torn clearing. Ahead of me, ruining the view, were huge logging machines and a group of people arguing in their shadow. I thought the machines were sucking the life out of the air, like they were a wound, not just pieces of equipment. I looked at the clearing. The trees they'd cut down lay in the middle, thrown together, lifeless, limp, just like the dream. Surrounding them were the harvesters that killed them and people who squabbled over their corpses. The protesters, the reporters, the police, and of course the loggers. The harvesters loomed over the clearing, reeking. And there I saw a familiar face among the protesters. Lisa was standing next to Olga from the cemetery, who was arguing with a vaguely military-looking man in his thirties. The protesters were clearly conflicted. be fun. I mean, no, we are an outsider. I don't think we can and we should. They are grown-ups, they can do that themselves. But what does that mean? It could be fun. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, maybe we can clear the conflict, but I, I think it's a bit arrogant <laughs> trying that. But that too, that's the same. And I mean, having fun towards them is also pretty rude. So yeah, maybe I could solve the conflict. The protesters were clearly conflicted. I thrived in solving conflicts, so I went closer. One of the police officers, young and nervous, said something I didn't fully understand. I smiled. 
at him and said, I don't understand. In my best Polish. He smiled back. Oh, he said, you're one of them. And then let us go. Then I noticed that someone joined us. And then I noticed that someone used the commotion to sneak up, to sneak with us past the police. A girl with disheveled, bleached out hair. Don't worry, she patted the officer on the arm. It was an awful pickup line anyway. He recoiled. I... you shouldn't touch me, ma'am. <laughs> Keep smiling. I smiled at her and wanted to say something, but I was interrupted. Pat. Some guy called her from the gathering. Could you come here? I need you to show Olga that chart. She sighed, reaching to her backpack and taking out a tablet. And there at it again, she murmured under her breath and winked at me. Coming! As I walked towards Lisa, I heard more and more of the argument. Olga, you can't! The man was speaking with a strong German accent. Pat stood next to him with her tablet. She looked a bit amused. Do not fucking tell me what I can or can't do, Colonel, Olga interrupted. I can, because they are destroying our mother. I can fight with all the means at my disposal, even if that means burning those harvesters to the ground. A slender, green-eyed man was standing near, near her. He took a few steps back, went towards one of the harvesters, turned his back on us all and pissed on the machine. Olga smirked. Ah, Daniel, you know how to bring the point home. He looked at her confused. <laughs> Colonel raised his eyebrows. Burn the harvesters? Colonel asked calmly. In this drought? Olgar, are you out of your mind? You know what I mean. We fight them any way we can. Because this is a fucking war, she said. He sighed. You've never seen real war and it shows. Nobody is shooting at us and believe me, we want it to stay that way. We need a peaceful protest. Approach, approach Lisa. Hey, can we talk? I asked, approaching Lisa. Oh, hi Maya, good to see you. Listen, we have a little dispute here. Maybe you'll be able to explain the problem to our friend. Oh, so I was to take a stand. I looked at them. At them both. Olga with her fury and passion. Cornell with his cool professional demeanor and shared without any reservations what I felt about the situation. Hmm. Yeah, I think there's a fine line to treat. Olga is cautious, Cornell and friendly. Lisa is cautious and Daniel cautious and Kim sympathetic. There's a fine line to treat, I said in the silence. You don't want the protesters to be painted as terrorists and you don't want them to be treated as irrelevant and ignored. Kim shook their head and moved forward. I observed him curiously. Olga, darling, you know I love you, but Cornell really knows what he's doing. Please trust me on that one. They looked at her apologetically. Fuck off, Kim. You didn't even trust me enough to come here on your own when I asked you to. Lisa decided to say something. Lisa looked them straight in the eye. She had a peculiar accent. Kim. You want to teach me about violence? She looked them straight in the eye. About fighting oppression? Just because your boss went to what? One mission in Afghanistan? Her Polish was peculiar, kind of mellow. Colonel winced. Lisa, leave Kim alone. I... He didn't know what to say, and it seemed that the whole discussion would be derailed. I didn't let that happen. Hey guys, the forest, I said. The logging, the protest. Olga unclenched her fists. 
Kunal looked back at her and chuckled softly. You almost punched me. The conversation was over, at least for the time being. Kunal, together with his cronies, walked towards the reporters while Olga went back to the group of people standing in the shadow of an old oak tree. I looked at the posture. The clearing full of felled trees was like a gaping, bleeding wound in the chest of a friend. I had to do something. I looked at my friends. We have to stop this logging. Yes, just like Olga said, Anya nodded, excited. What they're doing is unforgivable and we have to fight. It is a very complicated situation. Bartek looked thoughtful. I liked what that guy Connell said, that we should proceed peacefully, not to discourage the public and potential supporters. I looked at one crew and then at the other. The harvesters were dripping with black oil and the forest stood tall, serene and full of golden light. It looked like it could protest protect itself. And then I looked at the felt trees, dead, limp, helpless. I mean, we're not going to burn down the forest. <laughs> uh, I think that would be the worst, um, worst thing to do, because you cannot control a fire like that in the forest in the summer, in June, when it's hot. So we would not only destroy the harvesters, uh, we would destroy the forest itself. And a wildfire in such a region is just getting out of control so fast. It's not, it's not a thing. It's not, it's not possible. It's just stupid. So... Hmm. But, I mean, I understand why they are angry, and I would be angry too, but that just doesn't help. If you want to get somewhere, you have to think about the future too. Burning down the forest would only help the logging people. Because less forest, more land, for example, to build on. That's how forests vanish, not how to protect them. And uh, thus, I think we need a smart protest which people can get behind so I go for Cornell and the diplomacy even if I maybe don't like him personally but we don't know him yet so I don't know in the timeline as I approached the group Kim waved at me come here they took me straight to the leader of their group the man who was arguing with Olga hello Maya he said I see you haven't come alone. He reached out his hand. I shook it. His handshake was firm and strong. His eyes were an uncanny shade of grey. He might have been in his early thirties, I thought. But there was more to him. More to him than his pretty bad boy attitude. I wasn't sure what it was, but I felt it. And he knew that I knew. Colonel looked me in the eyes. I know why you came to Piavo Viesha. The forest is reaching out to you, because for a long time your ancestors were its servants. And now you are the only one left to pay what they owed. He seemed to believe it. I looked at him, skeptical, but he seemed to believe it. The important question is, he looked at me intensely, do you want to help? I had no time to answer that. I heard a commotion and turned around. The reporters were coming our way, but their cameras were switched off and pointed at the ground. I had an idea. I ignored them and turned back to Cornell. Hmm. The 
The media needed something spectacular. There was a way we could use the media. I think we should spin the media, I said. Make the headliners. That's the plan, he nodded and turned toward the reporters. So, he asked. There was a hint of impatience in his voice. The reporter shook his head and grimaced. Sorry everyone, we can't do anything. You're not allowed to cover what's going on here. Huh. Suddenly I understood. It hit me. The police weren't there to protect the protesters or the press. Yeah, it must be hard to do your job when the police is watching your every step, I said, and they nodded. There was a moment of tense silence, and then it all came together. I understood the dream. That was the moment I was destined to intervene. The protest was too quiet. They needed inspiration. The voice of reason. I took a step back and looked at the bigger picture. Hmm. If we watch the cops, we gain rage. But they are against the press too, so the press is for us, right? I took a step back and looked at the bigger picture. I watched the police as they started to push into the protesters. I could see their faces covered in sweat under the helmets. Got any brilliant ideas? Cornell asked me. I grabbed a megaphone from the hands of a confused young man and jumped on a nearby tree stump. Audio feedback screeched and heads turned my way. I had one chance to take control of the situation. I should focus on what was important. We'd forgotten where we were. Hmm, I don't know where this will lead to. We had forgotten where we were. Where in the forest. We should focus on what was important. Yeah, always, but what do you mean? <laughs> oh gosh, I'm so spiritual. <laughs> Listen, I paused, and in the silence we all heard the sounds of the forest. Let's remember where we are. The police and the press have their orders, and we have our mission. We are standing in the oldest forest of Europe. We all understand how this works, I continued, considering my next words carefully. Escalating will only bring more problems. We will all be here for a long time. Let's take a step back. Oh, I should have chosen the other option. I didn't know that you would actually say that. I just thought you would think about what she wants to say. <laughs> they looked at me. I could see the same look emerging on the faces of the officers and protesters. Their eyes narrowed, their jaws tightened. A journalist started to laugh. Yeah. Yeah, that was not that was not a smart idea <laughs> on my part. I felt someone grabbing my arm. Mistakes are made. I wanted to yank my hand away, but the grip was strong. You'd better go now, said Colonel. We'll take it from here. Yeah. Better that way. <laughs> the ugly truth. When I was on the road to the village and nobody could see me, I doubled over and vomited. I always felt violently sick when there was too much to process at once. In the whole commotion I lost Anya and Bartek from my sight. I was alone. Or so I thought. 
Hey, are you all right? A voice behind me said, and I jumped. A woman was walking towards me. I was fine. I sat stiffly. She rummaged in her pockets and handed me a handkerchief. Here, she said. I have water as well if you need some. We walked slowly toward the village. I learned that she was an independent German reporter who'd come here about a month ago. Her name was Erika. So why are you protesting the locking? She asked after a few minutes of small talk. I mean, we have to save the Pustja. I think the Pustja is unique. And when I saw how many trees they've cut in just one afternoon, it broke my heart. I said, still shaken by the sheer number of the fallen trees. I have to do whatever I can to save the forest. I looked at her. And why are you asking? She looked at me with renewed interest. Do you know why they are cutting down the trees? She asked back. Because you do know that logging is done by a government company. The state forests. <laughs> the fuckers. <laughs> I had no idea. I didn't know that, I admitted. In fact, I knew very little. I know very little about the situation, I realized. Just what the others have told me. Erika reached for her notebook. It all started with spruce bark beetles. Erika looked into her notes and started explaining the whole situation. That year the beetles infestation was of catastrophic proportions and the foresters decided that the only way to stop it and save the rest of the forest was to cut down as many infested trees as fast as possible. Hmm. Was cutting down the trees really necessary? Is cutting down trees the only way to stop the infestation? I asked, confused. The foresters state that this is the only way, she said. Some biologists argue that they are cutting wrong trees and doing it too late to change anything. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, these are biologists. They know about the beetles, I hope, better than uh, the foresters. And if it's actually a primeval forest, then it can regulate itself. So people shouldn't mess with it, because everywhere where people mess with nature, it's getting worse, not better. Right? Yeah, just don't remove any trees. Dead trees are also of value for, for, a un for an untouched forest. I mean, this forest isn't untouched. You can walk through it, ride through it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Was the logging legal? I wanted to know. Opinions differ, but such massive logging in a UNESCO listed area might be illegal, Erika answered. Couldn't they just remove the dead trees? Maybe. If they removed the dead trees, the infestation wouldn't spread. I tried to find a solution. They might do that, but dead trees are what make the forest unique, Erika smiled. There are 20 times more species living on a dead tr spruce tree than on an alive one. Yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. You need the dead trees in a forest to create more forest. <laughs> Because the rotting process is an important part of the forest. It's all a circle. Did they have to intervene at all? Couldn't they just leave the pushcha alone and let nature take its course? I asked. That's one of the opinions, Erika admitted. But there's a drought and no one is sure if the forest would survive on its own. Yeah, yeah, but the drought also is man-made. 
It was a complex situation, but that didn't mean that I should step back. I felt that Erika was deliberately playing the devil's advocate. I needed advice. I'm not sure what to think about it, I admitted. I could really use your advice. I'm just doing my job, Erika shrugged. I describe all aspects of the situation to you, but it's up to you to decide what you want to. Everyone had their jobs. I nodded. That was her job. My job, job was to do something about the situation. At least I was sure that they were cutting down the trees and the push chair needed my help. Hmm. I asked her to stop and listen. Stop for a moment and just listen, I asked Erika. We stood there, listening to the birds and the wind in the trees. We breathed in the smell of the forest. We felt the sun on our faces. That's why I cannot let them cut down the trees, I said. She looked skeptical. You're not the only one feeling helpless, she sighed. So don't let the complexity of the situation stop you. Life is always complex, and yet we carry on. I said nothing. There was so much to process at once. Everything that happened at the locking site, the heat, the stench of the harvesters, the tension between Olga and Colonel Korn that you could cut with a knife, it all made my head spin. What's the matter? she asked. I felt so helpless when I saw all that. I took a deep, a deep breath when I remembered what Cornell had said. And they said that I have some family debts to pay. I shook my head. It's a lot to take in, and there was that foul smell back there. She looked at me with a weird expression. What smell? she asked. How come she didn't smell it? You, you didn't smell it? The harvesters reeked of something, like, like meat that's been rotting in acid, only worse. I couldn't even find the words to describe it, but the memory of the foulness still clung to the back of my throat, swimming in my sin sinuses. She looked at me with a strange expression on her face, as though she wanted to say something and then thought better of it. There was sympathy in her eyes. You'll learn in your own time if you stay here long enough, she said, clearly wanting to drop the topic. But what did she mean? What do you mean? I asked, getting irritated. I just told you, you'll learn in time, or not at all, which would frankly be better. Anyway, gotta run. As I watched her leave, I thought that Whatever was my family legacy had surely manifested itself that day. I guess I'd made some progress. I jumped right into the middle of a very tense situation and at the very least upset the status quo. I just hoped I hadn't made things worse. So I walked on in silence. I think I end this episode here uh, it seems to be a bit too long if I cover the whole days, depends on where we go. And uh, it seems we have the dreams at night, so either we start with the dreams or end with the dreams or end with the evening, I don't know yet. This one I end here, then we start with regrouping and then supposedly the night and the dream and then we'll see what will come tomorrow. Thank you so, so much for watching this episode. Have a wonderful and adventurous day and goodbye.